Hey, what's up, 2020? This is Andre Callejas, and today we're going to be going over uh, Dr. Littleton's GI Physiology Lectures. That was those three lectures you guys had this week. A little bit about Dr. Littleton. Uh, he's a great guy. He's going to be teaching you lectures as well. Second year, and um, so he gives you guys a lecture on, the, on GI Physiology. Really old school guy, just one PowerPoint, 89 slides. Three lectures based on that. He kind of just lectures off the top of his head. He's very knowledgeable. He's very passionate about GI. Um, he was he was my SGL proctor for one of his SGLs, and he spoke about how his brother, um, um, you know, passed away because of some GI physiology pathology while he was in medical school. And we believe that that's one of the reasons why he got into into uh, uh, GI medicine. Um, and just one thing about this lecture, very clutch. If you can master this lecture, then that's all you need to know for GI physiology second year. Almost all of it. This lecture is so high yield that even I, as a second year, went back and re and downloaded the lecture again just because the lec just because his slides were pretty clutch. They had some really nice diagrams that I liked and that simplified a lot of stuff. Again, not much of GI physiology has changed within the last like 20 years. So um, this lecture is really, really clutch. If you could do well in this lecture, second year uh, for the GI organ system is going to be a breeze. All right, so he starts off the GI at the mouth, right? We're going to go from mouth to anus. And, and at the mouth, um, you know, we have uh, enzymes there. We're going to have uh, uh, oral, am uh, oral amylase. And what does amylase do? Amylase breaks down starch, right? amylase right here, right? So this is going to be oral amylase because we also have a pancreatic amylase. We'll talk more about that later. But what you need to know about saliva is besides the fact that, yeah, it has mucins for lubrication, right? We all know that. Uh, amylase is a big guy here because that's because we can say that digestion begins in the mouth. We can say that. And the reason why we say that is because of the oral amylase that breaks down starch, right? Starch is your carbohydrates. Um... You also have uh, lipase, and then lipase is going to break down fats, um, lipids, and one of, one of the things you're going to, and uh, you also find IgA. So IgA is an immunoglobulin that you find in most mucous membranes. This is all over your GI, also in your respiratory system, as well as your you know GI system. IgA is immunoglobulin specific to, to, to um, these mucus producing systems. And that's something you'll learn later on more about um, for second year. Uh, one of the things I want to mention here is that notice that there is no enzyme that breaks down protein. Well, what do you guys think? I don't know if you guys eat tofu, but if, you know, if you've eaten tofu before, just plain regular tofu, it has no flavor. It has no flavor because we don't have any enzymes that break down protein in our mouth. And if we can't break down protein to molecule form, then that protein cannot bind to our taste bud receptors and create taste. However, we do have enzymes that break down starch and fat, and that's why we're able to taste starches and fats, but not protein. Uh, again, he just goes over some of the, um, the reasons why we have salivary secretions. All these are pretty straightforward. Let's talk more about the salivary gland. Something, we got, something that's pretty high yield here, is that saliva actually starts off as isotonic. So isotonic, what does that mean? We're going to go back to our undergrad science days, right? Right here we have an isotonic solution. Let's say in my isotonic solution I have um, six molecules, right? We're going to break this down, and then I'm going to have right here, I'm going to have hypotonic, iso, and hyper, right? In my hypotonic solution, I'm gonna have solutes less than the isotonic solution. So in this case, I'll only have probably like three, maybe two. Isotonic means that it's exactly the same as the solution we're comparing it to, right? So I'm gonna have six. And in hyper, meaning that you're gonna have a lot more solutes than the solution you're comparing it to. So what we're saying here is that your serum your serum, if we say your serum is isotonic, 
and we say saliva starts off isotonic, then that means they have the exact same osmolarity, the exact same concentration when saliva is secreted at first, at first. However, as saliva goes down the salivary gland, it becomes hypotonic. Hmm, how does this happen? How do we go from secreting saliva as isotonic and then it becoming hypotonic? Well, if you look at this diagram, which is pretty clutch, you'll see that saliva starts off, it has sodium and it has chloride in it. And as this and this solution as the solution goes through the passes through the salivary gland, you're gonna have a, t a lot of that sodium come out and a lot of that chloride come out. And those charges, right, that positive charge and that negative charge is going to be replaced by potassium going in and bicarb going in. And this is why the pH for saliva is alkaline. Now, you're not going to replace every single sodium molecule with one potassium ion. You're not going to replace every single chloride molecule with one bicarb ion. So therefore, you're going to take out more than you put in. And that's why you'll have, you'll end up, you'll start off with an isotonic solution, you'll end up with a hypotonic solution. And this is just a graph of him talking about the relationship between flow rate and the pH of, which is related, related to the bicarb of the, um, of saliva, right? As we see right here, when there is an extremely low flow rate, you see that the saliva contains um, really low. If we could trace back the sodium, it'll be over there. We can trace back the chloride, it'll be over here. We could trace back the bicarb, it'll be right here. But if we trace back the potassium, it'll be up here. So at a really low flow rate, we can see that saliva has a high potassium concentration. It has a high potassium concentration, and it has a generally low concentration of all of the other molecules, including sodium, bicarb, and, and chloride. And the reason why is because if saliva has a lot more time to stay in the lumen of the salivary gland, you'll have a, a lot more diffusion of, of sodium to leave, a lot more diffusion of chloride to leave, and you have a lot more time for potassium to go inside, but bicarbonate doesn't behave the same way. It has its own channel. Therefore, it's not going to go in as much. That's why ultimately, if this saliva is going pretty slow, then you'll have a high potassium concentration, which is shown in this graph. Okay. Right here, he talks about something called, um, he begins to talk about peristalsis, right? What is peristalsis? Peristalsis are involuntary contractions of the muscles that line our gut. And I'll talk more about that later. This is just an introduction because he starts off at the beginning of the GI, which is our mouth, and he's working his way down, right? So after our mouth, food goes into what? Our esophagus, right? And one thing about the esophagus that you have to understand is the esophagus is divided into an upper um esophagus, a middle, and then a lower esophagus, right? So this is your upper, this is your middle, this is your lower. The upper esophagus is strictly skeletal muscle, meaning that this is straight up under our voluntary control. The middle esophagus is a mixture of smooth and skeletal muscle. So right there, it's kind, it gets kind of fuzzy there because you have both um, skeletal and smooth muscle there, so voluntary and involuntary. And then finally, at the lower esophagus, that one is complete smooth muscle that is out of our control. Those actions are strictly involuntary. Um, so what is what what are what are the what are the uh, the, the neurotransmitters the, the the kind of hormones involved in peristalsis or propagation of this bolus? Right, when you swallow something, it becomes a bolus. Um, you're gonna have acetylcholine, nitric oxide, and VIP. So VIP stands for vasoactive intestinal peptide. And we're going to talk more about this. Right? Again, this is just an introductory slide. This whole thing of propagation of food going down the tube, we're going to talk more about this later on when it comes to like the, the, intestines, the intestines. But basically, the gist of it is this right here. I could just mention it. that This is the point of it, right? 
you have a bolus of food, and the point of the bolus of food is to, is to make it travel down, right? So you're going to contract certain muscles, which are going to push the food forward, and you're going to be contracting it as you go along so that the food can be, the bolus of food can be pushed forward. That's, that's the gist of peristalsis. Um, so, so what happens to that salivary amylase, right? Remember I said um, we have oral amylase and we have pancreatic amylase. Um, so it's all salivary amylase, also known as, you know, oral amylase. Um, you know, this begins the digestion of, of your starches, but it isn't fully, fully activated until it gets to the stomach. So let's say you have sal sal salivary amylase, you have 100 units of it. When it gets to the stomach, which has a really low pH, 5 to 6, that's when salivary amylase uses its full potential and most of it gets used up. So we, went, we go from 100 units in the esophagus to 50 units leaving the stomach. This means that this pH in the stomach actually activated the amylase and, and potentiated more. And you have this graph right here that kind of shows that. You can see that the amylase activity increases as the as the pH um, kind of uh, I'm sorry this this I'm sorry I meant to say that this kind of shuts down the amylase activity this shuts down the amylase activity as you can see as we go to a lower pH you can see the amylase activity start to go down this starts to go down so the p the salivary amylase in the stomach gets turned off pretty much that's what I meant to say. Uh, right here, he just talks a little bit about the anatomy of the GI lining. It's something that's a. Uh, I, I think I think first aid does a pretty good job explaining it, right? So the so the 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 G, GI tract, right? It has four layers, right? You have a mucosa. You have a mucosa. You have a submucosa. You have a muscularis externa, and then you have a serosa. The muscularis externa is a misnomer, right? Because it has the word externa in it. You'll think you're thinking it's the most external part of the GI tract. It's not. The serosa is. And and what's funny about the serosa is that some parts we call it adventitia. And those parts are when it's retroperitoneal. So adventitia and serosa are the exact same thing. The only thing is that it has a different name when we're talking about retroperitoneal organs. Now, the mucosa layer itself is actually divided into three things. We see that the mucosa has epithelium. It has a lamina propria. So underneath every every epithelium, you guys are doing histology right now. What do you find? Loose connective tissue. Underneath every epithelium is the same thing: loose connective tissue. And there, here we call it lamina propria. Then you have something called muscularis mucosa, not to be confused with muscularis externa. Remember, the mucosa is three layers. The mucosa is epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis mucosa. Muscularis externa is a completely different thing, right? Then we have the submucosa, which contains submucosal glands. And in the submucosa, you have something called the Meissner plexus, which is also called the submucosal nerve plexus. Now, you should know both names because both names are fair game. Meissner, submucosa, submucosal nerve plexus, same thing. But just know both names. Uh, and, it, and it's actually right here, right under, right here, some, some mucosal nerve plexus, right? Then you have the muscularis layer. Now, the muscularis layer contains a, two layers of muscle. What are those two layers of muscle? Well, first is the inner circular muscle. Is, uh, you're going to have the, the inner circular layer. You're also going to have the outer longitudinal layer. And in between those layers, you're going to have something called the myenteric nerve plexus, also known as the Arabach plexus. And I'll talk more about the significance of that later on. Um, also, I know you guys have a, you guys should have a lecture that talks about retroperitoneal organs. For those of you who don't have first aid yet, I uh, definitely recommend buying it. But here's just a really great mnemonic that I have to share with you guys as far as retroperitoneal structures go. Here's a great mnemonic, sad pucker, right? Sad pucker basically have all of your retroperitoneal organs. So the S stands for suprarenal, which are your adrenal glands. These are the glands that are on top of the kidneys. Uh, aorta and inferior vena cava. Duodenum, but to be specific, the second through the fourth part, because the first part 
of the duodenum. Don't forget, the first part of the duodenum is attached to the stomach. So this is the first part right here. And then this right here is the second part. So the first part is attached to the stomach, which is the stomach being being peritoneal. It's not being intraperitoneal. Um, the first part of the duodenum, therefore, is not retroperitoneal. So the pancreas is also retroperitoneal. Um, you know, the pancreas dumps into the second part of the duodenum, and it kind of looks like this. You have a uncus, you have a head, you have a body, and then you have a tail. Now, the tail is actually intraperitoneal, but the rest of the pancreas is retroperitoneal. So the ureters are not shown in this image right here, but it's retroperitoneal. Uh, the C, the colon, the colon, only two parts of it are retroperitoneal, the descending and ascending. Don't forget your colon um, kind of starts off. Here's the appendix right there, ileum, ileocecal junction, right? And then the colon kind of goes like this. It goes up. We call that the ascending colon. It goes, you know, to the other side. We call that the transverse or middle colon. Then we, ha then it goes down. We have call that the descending colon, right? Then that becomes your sigmoid colon and then your rectum and all that. Um, so basically. Uh, only these parts right here are retroperitoneal, the ascending and descending colon. The middle colon is actually intraperitoneal. It's wrapped by intra by peritoneum. Kidneys are a no-brainer, right? If we said that the ureters, which come off of the kidneys, are retroperitoneal, then the kidneys should be as well, right? So you just recap, this is what a kidney looks like, and then the ureters come down like that. The esophagus is retroperitoneal. Uh, as well as your actual your rectum, partially, is retroperitoneal. Just a quick mnemonic, you guys, this is an easy point on the exam. I've seen, I've seen this question come up in some way of, of them asking you, oh, which, which organ or which part of the GI is retroperitoneal. Easy point, easy point. Um, high yield right here, the difference between an erosion and an ulcer. An erosion is less severe. Erosion is less severe. An erosion is limited. The erosion is limited to the mucosa, meaning that the erosion does not cross the last layer of the mucosa, which would be what? That's going to be the muscularis layer. Remember that the mucosa is made up of three layers, right? You have the epithelium. Then you have the lamina propria. Then you have the muscularis mucosa, right? Anything before the muscularis mucosa, we call that an erosion. If it crosses the muscularis mucosa, we call that... If it, cross, if it crosses through the muscularis mucosa, we call that an ulcer. This is a very high yield thing to know, um, and it's come up on my practice questions for GI. Also, I've seen the question of this, you know, in one of your old exams. I didn't bother putting it here, but um, just know the difference between erosion and ulcer. Um, so, a little bit about the stomach, right? You, you kind of get some anatomy here. Uh, the stomach, if we were to uh, see it right here, you have this cardiac area, which is right where the esophagus enters. You have the fundus area, which is where a lot of food storage takes place. You have the corpus area, which is a fancy word for body. So corpus and body are the same thing. Uh, right here, you have a lot of a lot of uh, acid secretion. You have the antrum layer, the antrum uh, um, part, and then you go into the duodenum, where you have the duodenal bulb because it kind of bulges out like a bulb. Uh, this is also called like the superior duodenum, the first part of duodenum. You pick your poison, right? Um, right here, you can see that right here. He gives you just a little uh, imagery, imagery right here. Um, right here, they, they, they've done what they call a barium air contrast. Notice how none of this liquid is actually inside the stomach. Well, the reason why is because your lower esophageal sphincter, which is right there, is tonically constricted, meaning that it's always closed. Unless you're eating food and swallowing, it's always closed. So if you swallow barium, then it's not going to reach the stomach because you're not eating food. Um, this is just uh, him. He uses this 
to say that the colon has a slow wave propagation. Uh, one of his reasons for including this slide is that he wants you to know that the colon basically serves as like a storage, it's like a storage organ, not like the stomach that stores food, but this one stores, you know, the, the, the stool until you have, until you've collected enough stool to, you know, go, 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 go defecate. So this is his, this is the reason why he includes this slide, just to talk about the colon in that, in that sense, right? You know, stool comes in through here, travels through down, and then as stool gets collected here, it's going to distend, it's going to distend the rectum, and that distension uh, basically signals your brain that, hey, I should go use the restroom. So basically right here, the colon and the slow wave propagation does more to do with storage of feces and the formation of it, right? Because there's a lot of, a, lot, a little bit more absorption that happens in the colon, right? More fine touches. Um, the GI tract, right? How do they? How does the GI tract communicate with each other? Uh, through hormonal, hormonal stuff. Um, you have endocrine. Endocrine meaning that um, a cell secretes its hormones into the bloodstream, and then the bloodstream takes those hormones to a target cell. You also have neurocrine, which is, I mean, the same thing as saying, you know, neuronal excitation, right? You have nerves. That's to, that's to create their neurotransmitter onto target cells. Pretty straightforward. You have paracrine, right? Paracrine means that a cell secretes its hormones to affect the cell right next to it. Para meaning, you know, right next to. Just a couple of diagrams, right? Take you back to a little bit of molecules and cells. Remember this? The lady who talked about the, you know, the cytokine stuff. So autocrine meaning that hormones get released by the cell to bind to a receptor on the cell. Paracrine, they get released. They're not involved with no blood, no circulation. They get released and go straight to the nearby cell. And then endocrine, which you'll learn a lot more about uh, you know, when you guys get the endocrine lectures. This one involves cells releasing the, their hormone into the bloodstream and you know, re reaching a target cell. Um, just like a little cooler, better diagram I saw of that, of, you know, differences between these. Um, you know, you could get that random question, easy point. How does paracrine signaling work? Endocrine signaling, autocrine signaling, etc. All right. So right here, this is, an, this is just a, a busy slide, right? He, he, throws, he throws this table of hormones at you, right? And expects you to just, you know, understand them. I could talk a lot about these, but I'd, I'd rather just explain my way through them, right? And and I'll, I'm, a, I'm just gonna point out the heavy hitters that you guys should just start working into your memory. Definitely, definitely know gastrin. Definitely know gastrin. Definitely know cholecystokinin, CCK, somatostatin, uh, gastrin releasing peptides, secretin, gastrin inhibitory peptide, motilin. You can know that. Um, he wants you to know this, but it's not important for stuff. So pancreatic polypeptide. Definitely know vasoactive intestinal peptide. Histamine is important. Uh, serotonin. Substance P and maybe norepinephrine. But I'll, like I said, it's a lot for me to say here. Oh, just memorize these. But in this lecture, as we go along, you'll see the role that these hormones play. If you know the roles, that these hormones play when and where, it will make it so much easier to understand their location and what they do. So this is how first aid has it. You know, they, first aid is no different. They just put it all on the table. Obviously, their lecture videos are different. You know, they talk more about them. But I feel like um, I feel like it's better if I talk about each hormone using anatomy, right? Using anatomy. So. Let's just say, you know, you guys go to a food corner, right? And you eat the really good chicken cheeseburger. You eat it, right? The esophagus propagates that, you know, that you chew it, you eat it, you get you know the amylase in your the amylase in your mouth starts breaking down the starch. The lipases in your mouth start breaking down the fat. You know, you chew it, you swallow it, that bolus of food goes down your esophagus, propagation, peristalsis, bada bing, bada boom, it comes down to your stomach. 
Um, obviously, the, the lower esophageal sphincter is going to relax, right, and open up, and then that bolus of food goes down. When that bolus of food goes down, your vagus nerve by then has sent a few signals. It has sent a few signals to your stomach by then to say, hey, get ready. This bolus of food is coming down. What are those signals? Well, those signals are this. It, and it involves the vagus nerve, obviously, right? Vagus nerve, cranial nerve, 10. So it's going to release acetylcholine. It's going to release acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is going to, you know, go on this ganglion right here, which is on the wall of the stomach, and then go over here and release more acetylcholine. And this acetylcholine is going to act on parietal cells. So just hold that thought. The acetylcholine over here is going to release on this ganglion, and it's going to cause this, these nerve cells to release GRP. GRP stands for gastrin-releasing peptide. Gastrin-releasing peptide, right? Uh, so these gastrin-releasing peptides are going to cause these G cells to release gastrin. This gastrin is going to go and stimulate the parietal cells. It's going to stimulate it. It's going to stimulate those parietal cells, right? At the same time, it's going to stimulate these ECL cells. ECL stands for enterochromaffin-like. These are ECL cells. These ECL cells are pretty important because they release histamine. What does histamine do? It stimulates the parietal cell. So let me just stop right here. I know some of you guys have had anatomy in undergrad and understand this kind of stuff, had GI physiology before. What do parietal cells do? Parietal cells secrete two things, two very important things. They secrete hydrochloric acid and they also secrete intrinsic factor. It's easy to memorize the hydrochloric acid part. Everybody forgets the intrinsic factor part. Parietal cells secrete two things, hydrochloric acid, which makes up the acid of your stomach, and intrinsic factor. Now, if we look at the, the influence of parietal cells, right, we can see that three, there are three things that stimulate parietal cells, right? These three things, I like to call them HAG. HAG, right? So here's your parietal cell. This is your parietal cell. And, and inside the parietal cell, you have a bunch of acid, right? So how do you secrete the acid, right? Well, the H is going to be for histamine. It's going to make, it's one of the ways that parietal cells secrete acid. The A is for acetylcholine. That's going to make the parietal cells secrete acid. And the G is for gastrin. That's another one that's going to make the parietal cells secrete acid. And we can see all that is true right here, right? We see acetylcholine makes parietal cells secrete acid. We can see gastrin makes parietal cells secrete acid. And we can also see that histamine makes parietal cells secrete acid. You also have something called chief cells, right? It's going to clear the board up a little bit right here. It's getting kind of messy. You, ha you guys have something called chief cells. Chief cells are right here, right? Chief cells are right here. Um, these chief cells secrete pepsinogen. Pepsinogen, pepsinogen. Hmm. Whenever you guys see something that ends in ogen, you should think of it being a zymogen. What is Andre talking about? So I said, if you hear something that ends in ogen, you should think zymogen. Zymogen. So what is a zymogen? A zymogen is basically the inactive form of an enzyme, right? So you have an enzyme that's inactive and you have to activate it for it to become a fully active enzyme. So the inactive precursor form, we call that zymogen. Therefore, if we take pepsinogen and we say that these are being secreted by your chief cells, These are being secreted by your chief cells. Something happens to them and they become pepsin. What is pepsin? Pepsin is an enzyme that works to break down protein. There we go. Finally, you've been eating protein this whole time. When does it start being digested? In the stomach. Who's digesting it? Pepsin. So pepsinogen becomes pepsin.
Pepsinogen is a zymogen. This isn't the only zymogen involved in GI. There's plenty more, and I'll show you them later on. Pepsinogen becomes pepsin. Okay, who, who goes around and activates this enzyme? Acid. Acid. The pH of the stomach is what activates pepsinogen, the pepsin. So, follow along the story, right? So far, we talked about the parietal cells, we talked about histamine, we talked about gastrin, we talked about acetylcholine, we talked about hydrochloric acid, we talked about intrinsic factor, we talked about pepsinogen, we talked about G cells, we talked about gastrin releasing, uh, I'm sorry, gastrin, yeah, releasing a uh, protein or polypeptide, peptide. We could also talk about uh, mucus cells. Hmm, mucus cells, I wonder what they secrete. Mucus, easy, right? Mucus cells secrete mucus. Then we have these guys over here. So that's in taking place in the stomach, right? I'm gonna talk more about these cells in somatostatin. I'm gonna talk more about that later because that's like after the fact. We have these guys in your stomach, in your, in your small intestine, you have I cells, you have S cells, and you have K cells. So, let me just clear this up a little bit. So what do each of these do? Well, I cells secrete CCK, cholecystokinin, cholecystokinin. Get used to, like, get used to, it can be called CCK, it can be called cholecystokinin. Look at yourself in the mirror and practice that, practice saying these words. S cells secrete secretin. That one's easy. S, S. S cells secrete secretin. Okay. K cells secrete GIP. GIP stands for what? Glucose dependent. Insulin protein or peptide, whatever, and that does exactly what it sounds like. If once the if this cell senses glucose, when once this cell senses glucose, it's gonna tell the pancreas to secrete insulin into the blood, and then you know the rest. All right. So, what do CCK uh, and 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 what do CCK and what does CCK does? Well, CCK is I'm gonna say uh, is a pro digestive enzyme, meaning that it's it it promotes digestion. How does the CCK do this? Is the question. Well, let me just draw a little bit of. I'm gonna have to draw a little bit of anatomy here. Just bear with me. So right here we have the stomach, like this. You have the duodenum, kind of go like that. Um, right here you have the ampulla vader. You have your pancreas, and then you have your uh, common hepatic duct, and then right here you have the all bladder and then you have the bowel duct I'm sorry so this was right this right here was the bowel duct this right here is the bile duct this right here is the common hepatic duct and then you have the liver over here right so these eye cells over here so what's gonna first of all what turns them on what turns them on is uh, free fatty acids and amino acids, right? So fat and amino acids stimulate these I cells to secrete CCK. So what does CCK do? I just told you guys that it's pro, it's pro digestion. So it's gonna do a few things. One of the main things it does is that it's going to. Um, okay. So it's going to promote gastric emptying. It's going to promote the stomach to dump its contents out. It's going to promote the gallbladder to constrict, right? It's going to promote the gallbladder to constrict, so become smaller, so that the gallbladder can secrete 
It's bile. And in order for the bile to get to the lumen of the duodenum, CCK is going to tell this ampulla vader or sphincter of Odi, whatever you guys want to call it, it's going to tell it to dilate, to relax. Because you're telling the gallbladder to secrete all this bile. It's got, it's got to go somewhere, right? It's got to go into the lumen. So you're going to tell this ampulla vader to open up so that it can be secreted out. And that's, why I, that's what I mean when I say it's pro-digestive. So when everything's CCK, you have to think about three things. Location, where is it? In the duodenum. Two, what turns it on? Uh, what turns it on is free fatty acids and amino acids, right? Fat, fat and amino acids. Uh, three, what does it do? Well, I think of it as pro-digestion. How? It's going to tell the stomach to empty. It's going to tell the gallbladder to, constrict, to contract and dump its bile out. And then it's going to tell this ampulla vader to open so that the bile can come out. That's CCK for you. So that's CCK. Then we can talk about another one. And I'm just going to keep this, I'm going to keep this anatomy here to talk about the next one. So these are your eye cells over here, and then you have your S cells, right? What do your S cells secrete? Your S cells are going to secrete secretin. Well, what's going to cause the S cells to secrete secretin? Fat. Fatty acids. Fatty acids causes, causes the cells, the S cells to secrete secretin. What does secretin do? This is the main thing you got to know about secretin. Secretin has a few roles. But its main job, secretin's main job, is to tell the pancreas to secrete bicarb. Secretin tells the pancreas to secrete bicarb. What does the bicarb do? Well, you know how CCK is telling the stomach to empty out all of its contents? All of that contents have acid in them. Right? And the duodenum doesn't like acid as much. It's like, okay, this is this is too acidic for me. Let's get some alkaline in here. So then secretin gets activated and secretin says, I got you. I'm gonna tell the pancreas to release some bicarb into the lumen. Boom. That's how secretin works. Location, duodenum. What activates it? Fatty acids. Fats. Uh uh, yeah. Um, what does it do? It tells the pancreas to secrete bicarb. That's all you got to know. Um, and then finally, we have one more. Then you have your K cells. Your K cells are going to secrete GIP, right? Glucose dependent insulin. Uh, Glucose dependent insulinotropic peptide. What does it do? Well, it's going to tell the pancreas to secrete insulin. Right? And remember, the pancreas is going to secrete this insulin into your bloodstream. So the insulin is going to go into your bloodstream, right? You're going to go on your body and tell cells to, to absorb glucose, right? To let glucose go inside the cell. Um, so what activates it? Glucose. What does it do? It tells the pancreas to secrete insulin into the blood. Where is it? In the duodenum. Those are the three, those are three things you got to know about each hormone in the GI. Where is it? What turns it on? And what does it do? If you start learning this now that you're in first year, step a uh, 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 second year is going to be so much easier for you, so much easier. Now, mind you, there might be some nitpicky things that you know these hormones also do, but for right now, this is more than you what you need to know. And with that, 
Um, I think I talked a lot about that. Let me just go back here. And uh, let's look at what he says right here. Um, like I said, uh, gastrin is right here. Gastrin, what do we know about gastrin? It's secreted by G cells. Okay, we know that. What does it do? It tells parietal cells to secrete hydrogen, hydrogen ion. Okay. CCK, right? I talked about that. Uh, what it, where is it secreted by? It's secreted by I cells. Where is it? In the duodenum. What does it do? It tells the pancreas to secrete. Uh, um, it's a pro. It's a pro digestive enzyme. So in addition to it, you know, doing gastric emptying and constrict, con causing the gallbladder to constrict and causing the relaxation of sphincter OD, it's also going to tell. CCK is also going to tell the pancreas to secrete its enzymes. Because the pancreas has a crap ton of enzymes in there. And CCK, like I said, is pro-digestion. So it's also going to tell the pancreas to secrete those enzymes. To help with digestion. Uh, I didn't talk about somatostatin. I'm going to talk more about that a little bit. Um, GRP, we talked about that, right? GRP, remember? This is being released by your nerves. Um, secondary to acetylcholine, uh, uh, synapsing on that. And this is going to, these these are going to, um, these, these GRP cells are going to cause your G cells to secrete gastrin, right? And then some of that gastrin is going to go to your ECL cells to secrete histamine, right? Secrete, and I talked about that. Uh, just, go, just go back to the GRP. Remember I talked about it? GRP is down here. GRP is over here, right? Purely neuronal. This comes down right here, synapses on that. This comes down here, synapses on that. This is releasing GRP. The GRP binds to the G cells. The G cells secrete gastrin. The gastrin does two things. One, it directly, it directly, you know, induces the parietal cells. Two, it directly induces the ECL cells to secrete histamine. And then histamine is the one, another one that induces the parietal cell. Uh, so that was GRP. Motilin, all you got to know about motilin is that it's interdigestive. Interdigestive. What do I mean by interdigestive is that when you're not eating, your, your GI tract cleanses itself, right? Those little bits of feces that stay over, you know, little things here and there, um, dead bacteria, whatever. In between meals, when you're not eating, this is the guy who's in charge. Motilin is the one that's in charge of what they call your MMC. Your MMC. MMC. And NMC, MMC stands for your uh, migrating motor complex. Migrating motor complex so like I said when you're not eating in between meals this is the guy who's in charge it's basically renting out your your GI system through you know making it move uh, I'm gonna talk more about pancreatic polypeptide related later VIP as well okay histamine I talked about that right remember I said histamine is secreted by those ECL cells right and the ECL cells, which secrete histamine, histamine is going to bind to the parietal cells and tell it to secrete gastric acid. Um, so norepinephrine, talk more about that later as well. Uh, serotonin, talk more about that. And substance P, right? Talk more about that later. Stick around. Um, right here you have, um, here, right here has a slide about gastrin and cholecystokinin. Surprisingly enough, they, they, they kind of work on the same receptor, right? Gastrin, cholecystokinin. Because they have a very similar, uh, very similar uh, molecular structures. Right here, I think, what he was pointing at. And um, very similar structure. Uh, why is this important? Um, I think that's just this thing is that is that because as, as you can see over here how first aid kind of has it 
is that um, gastrin, this gastrin molecule binds to the CCK receptor that is on the parietal cell. So this right here is a gastric parietal cell, this whole blue thing. Um, it has a CCK receptor, and that's what gastrin binds to. What also binds to that is this is CCK as well. Um, so this is a really good picture of, of what I was talking about when it comes to what I like to call HAG. So this is H, A is over here, and then G is over here, right? HAG, HAG. Whenever I think HAG, I'm thinking these are the the molecules that stimulate the parietal cell to secrete acid. Like I said, histamine right here binds to your H2 receptor, and it's a it's a G-coupled protein receptor, so it's going to cause a cascade of events inside the cell. Ultimately, it's going to increase CAMP, and then CAMP is going to be the one that's going to aid with the hydrogen ion secretion. Um, you also have acetylcholine directly binding to the M3 receptor, and this is also going to this is also a G-coupled receptor, and this is going to cause your you to secrete more hydrogen ion, and then gastrin. I already talked about that, right? Now, yep. Let's see. So, with that, I have a question for you guys. So you guys know the deal. Just go ahead, pause the video, and answer this question. All right, so the question says, which cells of the stomach are responsible for secretion of an acid? So acid, I'm, th acid, I'm thinking, what do chief cells secrete? 